Lucas Aerospace Limited has factories on 17 sites all over Britain. In 1974, the company-wide shop stewards committee, known as the Combine Committee, were worried about continuing redundancies. Two of the shop stewards at the Wilsdon plant are Ernie Scarbrow and Mike Cooley. Mike Cooley describes the local employment situation. In the area where we work, there was a general decline in the engineering industry as a whole. All around us, engineering companies were closing down and were being replaced in the main by companies who were involved in distribution, that kind of semi-skilled sort of work. Now, you see here the beginning of the real industrial decline. That factory reduced to produce engineering components, now for sale. This next one along here was part of the GKN group, again producing mechanical engineering components. That's for sale and complete demolition. And this was typical of the decline in this area, so that the workers at Lucas down the road could see all these factories closing and realize that they had to develop an entirely new tactic for fighting these redundancies because they'd been clearly unsuccessful in those other factories down the road. We took the view that it was no good just waiting until the problems were on us and then whining to the government or to the TUC or whoever that we want the right to work. We thought that we have a very highly skilled, very competent workforce and we have the intelligence amongst ourselves to devise or endeavour to solve the problems for ourselves. In November 1974, representatives of the Combine Committee went to see Tony Benn, then Secretary of State for Industry, who was at the time considering the nationalisation of the aircraft industry. They expressed their great anxiety about the future of their company and the prospects for employment. And I said to them, well, look, why don't you go away and, as I suggested to them, and do a corporate strategy for your own company based on your own knowledge of the company, of the equipment, of the skills, of the market available. And they did. And it's one of the most remarkable exercises that's ever occurred in uh, uh, British industrial history. The Inter-Union Combine Committee spent a year putting the plan together. When it was made public, it received wide coverage from a variety of sources, including a prominent engineering management magazine. The Financial Times saw it as a unique initiative in industrial relations. So how did the plan come about, and what happened to it? The plant which took up the idea of the plan most readily was Burnley, one of the largest Lucas Aerospace factories, employing 3,000 people out of a total workforce of 14,000. Since the decline of the cotton industry, other industries like aerospace have moved into Burnley. But unemployment is still a major problem. The Lucas Aerospace plant here, relying like other aerospace sites on mainly aircraft and defence contracts, was hard hit by the Rolls-Royce crash of 1970. In July 1976, we filmed local shop stewards from both blue and white collar unions who'd worked on the plan to see why they had adopted this new approach. In uh, 1970, when we had the redundancy situation, so uh, our manager at that time had us in just, just prior to that and uh, was talking about the business not looking so clever today. And, uh, but never mind, lads. We've got all these lads over in research who are looking at new products. Mm. So when this business cropped up, the redundancy situation cropped up, then we thought, well, I did anyway. I thought, well, uh, oh, we're all right. The company's there. They've got these alternative products. Oh, we're laughing not to bother. We, don't, uh, we haven't got all our eggs in one basket, such as we've always been thinking. It isn't always uh, Rolls-Royce we're uh, relying upon and think people like that. The company are there. They have that building over there which they can do all these clever things. So we're all right, lads. However, it didn't transpire that way. And this we realised. Of course, once we realised that, then we said, well, we've got to do something now. The company are not going to do anything, and we've got to protect ourselves. What do you do when your job declines and goes? If it's not there and the manufacturing's not needed, what do you do? You go on the door. Now, this is a horrible prospect for any worker to be pitched onto the door, and it's very degrading. You can strike, you can occupy the factory, you can live there. But if there's no demand for the article that you've been making, if the demand's suddenly gone, then you can sit in there till the cows come home. So with that recent bitter experience in mind, I think it's probably stimulated us in Burnley, more than at the other factories, for example, to really sit down and grapple with the problems of what can 
people be usefully employed upon once, once the current product line disappears. It was the shop stewards at each site who took a leading role in putting the plan together, feeding ideas and information to the Central Combine Committee. But initially they found it difficult to involve the workforce. Now I remember when I sent round the questionnaire um, to draw on uh, the uh, knowledge of some of my members um, in compiling the technical side of the corporate plan, machine tools, plant, I sent a circular round that said we want answers to these questions and really your jobs depend on it and I got not one reply from it. It was primarily a committee of six in Burnley that uh, did the work, did the quote, you know, ask the questions, get the answers from wherever you can get them and that's really the big trick, you know, is to get the answers to questions because sometimes management are a little bit reluctant to divulge some information, you can't force it out of them and uh, this is the way it was done by, there was about six of us, I think, involved in Burma. It were new to us and we, we, we had nothing to look up on the read about. Uh, if other companies were thinking of doing anything similar, they could come and ask, uh, how do you go about it? Uh, we've like, done it from grassroots and uh, hope we make a success of it. In support from the workforce for their ideas, the Combine Committee organised a series of teach-ins on the corporate plan. The first of these was at Paddyham Town Hall near the Burnley plant. Could we uh, ask you to, uh, for order now, ladies and gentlemen, please, brothers and sisters, uh, just to start the ball rolling, uh, a few months ago we asked the Burnley workforce of Lucas Aerospace to endorse the corporate plan. Now, obviously, to a lot of the people within the workforce, we put a lot of blind faith into the shop stewards and the union representatives, in as much as the, uh, it's a very technical subject, and it obviously it's something you can't explain at the mass meeting. So, first and foremost, we've got to explain... At the meeting, shop stewards outlined the background to the plan, and Mike Cooley described some of the proposed products and showed a film of a prototype road rail vehicle, one of the pieces of hardware that had already been built and tested outside the company. The aim of the road rail vehicle was to provide a transport system which would be cheap and effective and would need, meet the needs that we've got in Britain to overcome congested cities and at the same time make full use of the national railway network that we've got. Now to achieve both of those things we had to have a vehicle that could run through a city as a coach and then by some means go straight onto the national railway network. We did that by designing a simple guide mechanism so that you could use the rubber tyres both when you were going along the road and on the rails. Besides the road rail vehicle, there were 150 other proposals in the fields of energy, medicine, transport and oceanics, with the emphasis being on products that met social needs, such as plans for heat pump units for council houses and an increased output of the company's kidney machines. But the plan didn't just outline proposed alternative products, it also called for new methods of production. At the teach-in, Mike Cooley illustrated some of the effects of current types of production by referring to an agreement between the Amalgamated Union of Engineering Workers and British Leyland on rest periods. Not 1.6 or 1.7, it's computer precise, 1.62. And the toilets, incidentally, have been strategically placed close to the production line. Recovery from fatigue, 1.3 minutes. Sitting down after standing too long, 65 seconds. For monotony, 32 seconds. Now we say that that form of technology is unacceptable. And if the only way to build cars and products of that kind is to use that kind of technology, then we should be questioning whether we should be making those kind of products in that sort of way at all. So what the plan was calling for was socially useful and needed products produced in a socially desirable way. But this is an approach which to some extent challenges existing concepts of profit. What percentage of the diversification is into a commercial competitive field as opposed to a social or socially acceptable health-wise field? Whether a product is regarded as profitable or not really depends on the value that the government and society puts on it. For example, it is regarded as profitable to make harriers, but not profitable to make kidney machines. Now, it's the same customer, the government. So it just depends on what price the government's put on it. 
and does one expect a hospital or a school to be profitable? Uh, I think for the ordinary workers, I think you appeal to the ordinary workers, not those who have been involved in the social <coughs> committees, uh, need a gap to be bridged, education to make them realize not what you've been emphasizing, to come away from this jumping for the carrot and the money, but to look forward something uh, more human value, more social value, more reliable and secure. How would we overcome this to come to our level? At your level, brought down to our shop floor level, it needs a lot of education. But these questions only brought out a few of the ideas the teaching obviously raised in the minds of the 300 people present. To illustrate the more complex response of the different members of the workforce, we filmed a subsequent discussion in the local pub between a shop floor worker and one of the research staff and two middle management planning engineers. Put it this way, if you work for a company, and for eight, ten years like I've I worked for like for ten years, and they're coming up, they're going to say, well, that's your lot, throw it up against the wall. You could be on the door now. I'm OK. I'm young, you know, but I'm calling myself young, I'm 30. But put yourself at, I'll put, put yourself at some net at 58. I'm not looking at nobody, <laughs> but just put yourself in the same yeah, position that was measured to this meeting. Yeah, what chances do you get? He's finished. He's on the door from 58. There we go, move. But well, why can't we set something up for this? Why can't they put the money in and let's... In Monta, we've had suggestion schemes now and it's plastered all over the walls in Lucas. Suggestions. He can put the suggestion <coughs> in now and it'll take him six or eight months before he even gets a reply. Most of us, uh, we sort of work on the shop floor and it's not the sort of the technical things that you can involve in. And like tonight was explained to us all the different aspects that we could get into, you know, like uh, into oceanics and, uh, you know, all, all those sorts of different things in medicine, you know. Yeah. Which we, I mean, I didn't even know Lucas made a kidney machine. You know, I mean, I'm young, I have a family, two kids. I've, I'm looking a lot further, I'm looking in, you know, with Lucas, I'm looking for years to come. What's going to happen then? Come to the Nobody actually mentioned it tonight. It was sort of, perhaps it deliberately remained, sort of kept it at a low profile. But it's basically a whole, wholly different philosophy, isn't it? You know, in the capitalist system, it's a question of uh, who managers, and this is a, a, a challenge to that. But when you start coming up, you say, okay, let's let's push the, the kidney machines. You know, let's make the kidney machine a, a big thing. Let's get them all out. Yeah, but they've got to satisfy the shareholders. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you've got money invested in the company, you want the return for your money. You don't want to be subsidising something that's sold. Well, it's the only question the five notes the shareholders yeah, are. That, These guys on the shop floor are going, you know, <coughs> the that's where the company is. Yeah. Well, they have to, because that's where they get the capital from to buy them. To well it, no. Yeah, well, then again, the same, the same again, thing. Again, you know, I agree with what you said. In May 1976, the company stated that they did not feel able to accept the proposals outlined in the plan. Although they offered to hold local consultative meetings on new products at site level, they would not meet the Combine Shop Stewards Committee to discuss the overall plan, claiming that the committee were not part of the established negotiating structure and were not a representative body. They issued a statement which in essence suggested that the products outlined in the plan were unsuited to the Lucas product range and were not likely to be profitable. But the Combine Committee does not accept that all the products are likely to be unprofitable. The profitable ones include the heat pump, which is like a refrigerator working in reverse and conserves a lot of energy. The company is still saying that that is not a viable product, but we have intercepted one of the company's own market surveys, which shows that the market for these in the domestic sector by 1985 will be 255 million, and in the commercial sector by 897 million pounds. Now added together, that's a thousand million pounds market. So nobody can seriously suggest that that's not viable. Obviously not all the products proposed for the various sites have as much market potential as this, but some clearly will. So why does Cooley think the company rejected their corporate plan? There are two reasons. Firstly, we are insisting that for every potentially profitable one that we give them, that they also take on board a socially useful one. So we're doing that within a collective bargaining framework. And they don't want to take on the socially useful ones. 
The second thing is they're very concerned at the shift in power. They actively di dislike the idea that their workers will begin to decide what products they should be making and how they should be making them. We would have liked the company to answer some of these points, but they repeatedly refused to take part in this program. The Transport and General Workers' Union was one of the unions who supported the plan. In a pamphlet on the implication of defence cuts, it encouraged the shop stewards in other firms to take up the idea. The TUC, although sympathetic to the plan, were apparently unable to intervene directly and declined to take part in this programme. In general, the response of the unions to the plan was less than enthusiastic. The kind of things we're doing are outside the normal trade union traditions. The Combine Committee itself is not really accepted into the trade union structure in any official sense. In our view, it's absolutely essential to have it, to deal with multinational companies, but the trade union movement as at present constituted doesn't cater for this kind of organisation. Ernest Scarbrow believes that the present trade union structure fails to deal with multi-plant companies because of its fragmentation by trade and by location. You, you talk about the, the major unions like the AUEW or the Transport and General Workers Unions, they're still based on, basically on the divisions whereby the country is split up into a number of separate groups and consequently they are not capable of dealing with anything on a, a national scale or a multi-union scale. I think also that the bureaucracy in the trade union movement is fearful or maybe even hostile to this high level of rank and file activism. In February 1977, Following rumours that 1,100 workers were to be made redundant, the Combine Committee sought a meeting at Westminster. More than 70 shop stewards arrived to explain the plan to the 11 MPs who attended the meeting. Later, these MPs invited Lucas executives to discuss the future of the company with them. The MPs most closely concerned with arranging the meetings and what happened subsequently were two backbench Labour MPs, Jeff Rooker and Audrey Wise. They were in favour of the plan and sought to gain support for it in Parliament and from government. What happened? Well, first of all, there's a major problem in that you can't ask parliamentary questions about an individual company of this nature, particularly as far as this corporate plan is concerned. The reason for that is there's no ministerial responsibility for the running of Luxes and ministers will only answer questions for matters on which they're responsible. And it, it brings out the divide between Whitehall and Westminster. In other words, the executive branch of government that carries out decisions and takes action is the government and Whitehall. It is not Parliament. And there's a great myth, of course, as far as the public are concerned, and in some ways, as far as the shop stewards of Lucas Aerospace are concerned, the Parliament runs the country, and we as backbenchers can make these decisions and put pressure to change the course of their company. This is not so. We can raise the matter in debate on, when we have a debate on defence, for instance, or a debate on industrial strategy, when industrial we've done policy. That, we've actually this had amendments done. down which specifically mention the Lucas corporate plan. But you have to then fall back to the, uh, well, it is a fallback position, to actually write to ministers. And, you exp and these take sometimes a long time to get replies. The average minister replying to a member of parliament will take four to six weeks, sometimes longer, to reply to a letter. So I wrote to ministers of the Department of Industry and uh, got very little change at all. We know that the government has weapons at its disposal in relation to Lucas if it wants to use them. For example, uh, Lucas, like all private companies, gets certain concessions, certain allowances. There is money uh, which could be uh, made conditional. Uh, on cooperation. Um, the government could uh, uh, use its power as a purchaser. Lucas, uh, the biggest customer of Lucas is the Ministry of Defence. The shop stewards were obviously disappointed that the government weren't prepared to help them. This surprised them since the plan seemed to fit in with the Labour government's industrial strategy and in particular with its policies on planning agreements and job creation. We invited the present Secretary of State for Industry to take part in the programme, but he also declined. 
they don't want to do anything about it because, in my view, it would represent a shift in power in industry. All the government's job creation schemes, such as cleaning up beaches, counting gravestones, lampposts and so on, all of these are costing the nation state 680 million pounds a year, but they do not change any of the power relationships. Whereas if our scheme were to be accepted, it would mean that workers would have the right to say what products they thought society needed. And they would be looking at products which were socially useful, not just profitable. And I don't think the government is willing to accept that kind of commitment. Tony Benn, now Secretary of State for Energy, sees the Lucas Initiative in a longer term perspective. It is not possible to change decisions in a complicated society in 24 hours or one year. And after all, Robert the Bruce, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. You've got all sorts of setbacks. And I have them myself. I mean, I'm trying to engage in campaigns all the time as a minister. You mustn't think that position alters because you're a cabinet minister. You're trying to persuade your officials. You're trying to persuade the House of Commons. You're trying to persuade the electors. You're trying to persuade cabinet colleagues. Trying to persuade uh, 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 groups of people, and I'm continually faced with setbacks. Uh, and I just refuse to believe that uh, effort of this quality and character uh, is wasted. It may take a bit of time. After all, there are many things uh, advocated in the middle of the 17th century by the levelers that have never been implemented, you know, in Britain. So you've got to take a proper perspective. The long-term perspective may be fine for a politician like Tony Benn, but it doesn't deal with the immediate problems of plant closures and loss of jobs which the alternative corporate plan was designed to avoid. Already the workforce has been cut from 18,000 in 1970 to 12,000 in 1977. Jobs continue to be lost on the various sites by natural wastage, that's to say positions not being filled when people leave. Outright redundancies were also expected, because although Lucas Industries is highly profitable, its aerospace division has seen a profit of 4.4 million pounds in 1976 turn into a loss in 1977. The Combine Committee feared that the company intended to run down the aerospace division. In March 1978, an announcement was made which seemed to confirm these fears. Five plants were scheduled to close, and 2,000 jobs were affected. It's perhaps a fitting conclusion to the story of the campaign so far that the response of the workers is now, in some respects, as negative as the management, the unions and the governments has been. Except that the shop stewards see it as a sad last option. We have now made a decision which we're carrying out to prevent the movement of any equipment or know-how from one plant to another so the company is being immobilised internally. But in some ways, this is a sign of defeat because we've had to go back to the old traditional trade union industrial sanction type situation. But if we're left with no other option, then we intend doing that.